and taking Dr. Judd's, taking Dr. Judd's class. And just, I was like, this is where I'm meant to be. So I did an internship at UT Southwestern and I got an offer there where I was working and I was specifically working in the um, community prevention and intervention unit, which was mainly um, involved with HIV and AIDS. But um, I brought in the domestic violence element, um, intimate partner violence. We were, wrote a grant. Um, there I was really exposed to grant writing and budgeting and program management and stuff like that. And the research element of, we were looking at the intersection of IPV, intimate partner violence and HIV positivity rates. And I was just super excited to run that program and be the program manager and just have access and be around some of the smartest women I've ever been around. Um, my direct boss was an MD, a female MD. Um, one of my, the researchers I worked with was a female PhD, Dr. Caitlin Jettelina, Dr. Amaris Luque, Dr. Liz Arnold. Like it was like a powerhouse of women. And it was just like one of the best uh, you know, mentorships I could ever, um, there wasn't a man in sight. It was super exciting. We would say that all the time. Um, so, and these women had brought in different skill sets. One was an HIV clinician. One was a PhD social worker, one or LCSW PhD. One was a PhD epidemiologist. And here I was with my LMSW, um, like going to the same meetings and exposed to the same things and being very lucky to be in the same room with these women. Um, and so I did that for about three years and the project was ending as projects do COVID happened. Um, and a lot of HIV money, a lot of IPV money, a lot of the university's re um, resources were being redirected to COVID and COVID is super important. It just wasn't where my passion was. <laughs> and I got uh, an old colleague of mine got in touch with me and she's like, Hey, there's a position opening. Um, would you be interested um, going back to your roots, which was working at a police department um, and working at doing, being a victim advocate um, in my early, like early 20s through my early 30s. And I said, yes. So I have now started or I'm in the process of starting, to be honest. Uh, it's a hard process. Um, it's called the Southeast Alliance Community Care Team. It is a um, and I can't see y'all in the class, so I don't know, but have any of y'all heard of Right Care, which is the DPD, Dallas Police Department mental health um, response team? Has anybody heard of that? Have y'all talked about that at all? No, uh -huh. we haven't. Uh -uh. Okay, so you can Google it. It's, it's basically, well, I'll talk about my program. So um, sometimes more people have heard about that. So our program is, um, is specifically for the cities of Mesquite. Balt Springs, Segoville, and Sunnyvale. So they've banded together and they're calling themselves the Southeast Alliance. They've created a mental health 911 response team or, well, I'm we're in the process of creating it. So if anyone in these, in these cities call police or fire um, and there's, a, there's an identified mental health crisis or a mental health issue, a welfare concern, um, anything like that, a social concern, they will call this team and we will be dispatched to the to the um, location to the address. So it's a the team is a paramedic and a social worker. I'm the program manager. I'll manage their um, I'll manage the teams in the different cities. Um, where we'll it's centrally located in Mesquite, and we dispatch to the different cities. And so right now I'm working on policies and procedures. Working on I, mean, I just had a. 45 minute conversation about ballistic vests and color of polos. So that's kind of what program management stuff does. Um, sometimes you get in the weeds with a lot of different stuff. I'm sure Dr. Judd understands that. Um, you can get uh, in what pants will be worn and the colors of the radios, um, the radios that we'll be using. They wanted them bright. So if they're lost, these are things that we have meetings about. Um, but so, Basically, it's a 911 response team to bring social workers working alongside um, police and fire to help with the mental health issues that are happening in the community. Because as probably most of you know, there's a lack of inpatient psychiatric services available, a lack of beds. Um, my colleague, Katie um, Offerblock that works at Parkland, she mentioned the other day that there's like 70, only 76 inpatient beds right now with Garland Behavioral Health closing and children's close their inpatient site. So a lot of people with the deinstitutionalizing, you know, mental health, what in the 80s, um, and now 
the lack of beds and lack of money, um, we're having to meet them in the community. So different cities have banded together to create these teams. Dallas has one called Right Care. Um, Rowlett has started one with the same bucket of grant money. I don't know the name of their team. And then DeSoto, Cedar Hill, Baltimore, um, excuse me, DeSoto, Cedar Hill, Lancaster, Glen Heights, Duncanville have started a team. So they're doing like regional concept teams to the cities that border each other to try to play off each other's services that are available. Um, they're all, we're all using different models. Um, this is a pilot program, it's seed money. So we're using a non-police based model. We're paramedic and social work teams only. Some of the other cities are using a mental health police officer and a social worker. So, but this model is uh, a little bit different than that. So we're gonna be going out, I'll be managing this. And the back end of that, I'm sure you're wondering, well, how does this tie into my research element of it? Um, I'm in charge of all the data and collecting it. We've gotten seed money for two years from Dallas County. Part of my job, other than getting it up and running from a standpoint of the uniforms, policies and procedures, radio procedures, call names, the van, ordering a van, all those things, my job in the background while this is going on is collecting all the data that can be collected to prove to the cities that this is financially in their best interest to keep it going by saving police money and salary, by saving um, you know, fire, EMS, and hospital rates. And it seems easy, right? Like we can just say we went on this many calls and we helped this many people but people want it tied to dollars and they want it to tie to risk factors and stuff like that. So we have to look at several different elements, probably over 50 to 100 different variables over all four cities. And so that's what I'll be doing in the background to try and gain more funding and prove to city council members and mayors that we're sustainable and that the, the cities will need us after these two years. That's, okay. that's great. <laughs> so the research aspect of it, because you had mentioned that you would actually be um, doing some coding, some different things like that to bring yes. things together. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm very lucky that all four cities and all four police departments and all four fire departments use different softwares. Um, none of the, you know, these four cities banded together to do this great thing. The city managers got together but there's not a uniform, they all use different dispatch centers. I mean, different police, I mean, everything from software systems to radio systems, they all use different things. So I've got to figure out how to make them all talk to each other. And I've got to figure out how to collect the data. So between meeting with each city IT department, the, depart, the police department, like sometimes they'll have their own police department. Mesquite, those four cities I'm working with, Mesquite, Fault Springs, Seagoville, Sunnyvale, they're different sizes. So some people just have like computer savvy police officers that are their IT people. Some would have actual police IT people that are paid. But then getting them to talk to each other and trying to figure out how to code it so we can pull and push data. And um, a lot of meetings and figuring how to get to it and where do we dump it? Because some of this stuff will be HIPAA compliant, will need to be HIPAA compliant. Do we dump it into an Excel spreadsheet? Um, do we dump it into a whole new software system? What software systems are out there for mental health related to police and fire? Um, and so coding those so they dump in the right place at the right time and are we're able to like get the data uh, to make sense. So. I don't know. Well, everything's like on the table right now. We haven't, um, like I said, I've only been here, I think this is my fifth week. So it's all starting new. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really like getting into the weeds on the, on the data part and trying to figure out how we're going to code it, but it's all very, um, and then different IT departments are, you know, some of them write SPSS, some of them write SAS, some of them write Excel, some of them, you know, the backgrounds are different and the researchers are different. So we're just all trying to find a common thread right now, which I don't know exactly what that's going to be. So that's um, a great example of <laughs> this IT, the technology, again, coming into the human services area, using the big data to not only develop the systems, but to analyze the systems mm -hmm. and having those I getting everybody to be able to talk together to get what they need is some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And 
So for this particular program, Melissa being a social worker, she brings a different perspective to this to work with these different IT professionals to make sure that they're going to get what they need to serve the clients, to serve the individuals who need, who need to be served and continue it to go. Because if it's just the IT people or if it's just the data analyst, they don't have the context for it all. Yeah. So that's another example of just a different area that you can go with your degrees. The other yes. aspect that this could eventually even come into that I'm seeing is um, you can get into some civil engineering stuff in terms of community layout, mm -hmm. um, availability of services in terms of creating public transportation things yeah. to go and all of that. So that all comes into that also from a community perspective. Yeah, we did a um, we did a needs assessment in the very very beginning. Um, quick, you know, five questions just for police and fire, and the, they're saying the biggest need in this there's no DART, um, so the biggest issue is transport. There's no Metro Care if you're familiar with Dallas County. So there's no there's nothing. It's kind of like a social service desert in this area. Um, even hospital wide or uh, hospital, we have DRG. And then there's uh, Baylor, Scotty White, Sunnyvale, which is like, if you can imagine, it's a very small hospital. I, I can't remember how many beds it has, but they just, or a desert. So um, that's another element. We're going to have to prove, uh, I'm in talks with some of these providers, like a Metro Care, the Parkland, Parkland doesn't have a COPC here. The closest one is Garland. So we're also in talks. With, we have to show them the volume that we're going to see and try and convince them to come to this area. Because they, if they're going to build an office and staff it, we're going to have to show them that we have the people that are going to come, the clientele. So I have to prove the volume. Um, and so that's going to be overloading them at their other clinics um, and us going out of our service. Like we're going to have to go to Samuel Boulevard, which is in Dallas and Lancaster Keys in the South area and just keep bringing them clients, unfortunately, um, because those are our only options for the Metro care. And then they're going to be like, okay, we're busy. We see you have the volume. Because I can tell them all day in theory, this is the number of calls we have so far. Like the police, for example, Mesquite, I've had them police pull the reports of how many mental health calls they've had, how many APALs, how many emergency detentions they've had that maybe didn't need to go to the hospital, but they didn't have another option um, for an immediate care. And, but the Metro cares and the family guidances and the, the COPCs, they're not seeing it right now. So I'm having, I'm going to have to prove it to them by showing them the data that we're bringing them. Um, and they'll have their own reporting systems, but I'll have to track it also so that we can keep the data um, clear, concise, because we're going to try and bring them into this service area and prove to them that their money will be well spent in this area. Money that's already stretched very, very thin. Mental health money that's stretched so thin that they don't even have enough, you know, client, you know, enough appointments for the clients in those, their areas. So it have to be them working with their federal funders to get more money. So it's like, um, it's, you know, there's so many levels that we're touching on the macro, micro, meso scale with this one project and trying to prove you know, that the need is here and we're going to provide services. And then this is the data that we're going to, um, the services we're going to provide. And this is the data that we can provide you with. Because so without the data and without the numbers, people don't, they won't talk to you. Yeah. So they don't, they, they don't want to, they're just like, what, what, what's the volume? What's the number? So I had already go into meetings with some reports, you know, and some data that was already done by the police departments that maybe wasn't, crystal clear or wasn't exactly what I needed because uh, I didn't help write the code or I didn't tell IT what I needed, but I had to go in with something to show volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where the data comes into it. Mm -hmm. um, the And she's talking about the, the desert, the social service desert, but also this in part of this Dallas area, it's a, um, there's food deserts. I mean, there is no grocery stores. Um, we're working, or actually Mr. Brumley was contacted by the state fair. I think I told y'all the state fair is a 503C. That means it's a nonprofit. The state fair of Texas is a nonprofit organization. We had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. So we started placing interns there. 
And so they've reached out to us to begin to work with them. But the gentleman who's over this state fair, he's made a determination that in they serve five zip codes right around there, right around mm -hmm. that state fair where that's at. They don't have internet. There's yep. um, uh, food deserts. They don't have the grocery stores. There's a container place on 45 where they, shipping containers where they bring stuff in off of ships and they bring stuff in off of um, trucks. It, it's, it could be a variety of things. They're related to that particular one, not in that exact area, but related to that, there are 4,000 job openings. And he wants job openings that have a minimum of $40,000 a year annual because he said that's what you could live on there. There's mm -hmm. 4,000 of them. The DART stops. It stops at UNT Dallas and the Veterans mm -hmm. Administration. It doesn't go beyond that. There was no public transportation to get anybody there for those jobs. Mm -hmm. That's a civil engineering issue, a bigger yes. issue. What he has done is he's actually gone to DART and they had unused vans. And he was able to demonstrate that if we could get these vans, if we could get individuals to this place, they could become employable, we could fill those positions, and they're going to earn a living wage. And so now, they could, however they have to get there, they can get to one of those areas in DART, either the Veterans Administration or UNT Dallas, mm -hmm. and there'll be a van there free of charge that will take them to the employment. They reduced those open positions by 15% at the beginning. But that's where some of this STEM stuff, the engineering. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe they're fixing our <laughs> air conditioning. We don't have air conditioning in the room. Um, Are y'all at the Mesquite campus? No, Today? we're at Commerce. Oh, oh, Commerce. Okay. Um, the civil engineering, the data specialists that can show the financial impact of this, of not having these services there. Um, you know, the technology people that can show how to connect it up. That's where we all have to start coming together. And again, <laughs> um, women in those positions bring a whole different perspective. They bring a yes. whole different perspective to the table. And that's why it's so important for you guys to fill out your dreams. Oh my gosh, are we going to have to listen to this? <laughs> For you to, to complete your dreams and get to those positions yes. because we need you in those positions. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are in these positions in social work positions and some other human service oriented positions, we need those individuals with these skills that can come to the table with us and help solve some of these problems. Um, and, and this is right here in our area. Yeah. So she's actually, again, with a social work degree, and a really good research background, I'll just say. I don't know if y'all heard, but she was one of my students. I was. Um, yeah. But with her degree and her understanding of the human aspect of it, she also has the skills to go in, create the data analysis, to create those technology, bring the people together, create the technological system that's necessary. So she has taken her degree and went a different route than what a traditional social worker is perceived yeah. to be. And that's what you can do with your degree. So it doesn't matter which one, if you're mathematics, if you're engineering, if you're veterinary, whatever. There's so many options that you can do with those degrees now that you can yeah. take those skills and put them to use in an area you may never thought that you could do on that part. No, I absolutely agree. And I think that we need more women in these type of positions because we know what it's like to have to juggle a family and juggle, you know, the needs. And we know what other people are dealing with. You know, I always say I, I have a seven-year-old son and I'm like, women run the world. It's just, you need to know this now so you can get used to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> even though, um, you know, when you look, you see men, but really it's women who are getting the things done. Um, and the more I look and the more I see women in the most important positions just super excites me. Um, and like I said, I'm, but for my research background, I, I kind of have a eclectic background, I guess, between the police and the research and just got very lucky and kind of made some good career moves, to be honest. Um, I don't know that I would have this job because they weren't looking for a social worker to be a program manager because usually social workers, if you think about it, they do 
therapy. Like if you think, you know, the city manager's like, well, so what is, we need a social worker to go see the people that are having mental, but what would the social worker do? And I said, well, let me tell you what I can do. And so I just show them and go and talk to them about that. And, you know, an interview with them and Tom, like, this is what I would do in the first 90 days is kind of how I took the approach and things like that. And they're like, oh, okay. So you know what you're talking about. And yeah. I'm not just another pretty face, <laughs> but, um, so you're at the important. table with a lot of men because you're working with police departments, fire departments yep. that yes. are male. Yes. A lot of egos. So when I took this job, I was very frank because here's another thing I, I, I tell also my students and any um, baby social workers, interns that I deal with is women and social workers do not negotiate their salary enough. Women do not negotiate and social workers do not negotiate. Never, ever take the first offer. Um, When I was made the offer for the city uh, that I'm working with now, um, it was a nice offer. It was great. But I came back and I said, I have to deal with four city managers, four police chiefs, and four fire chiefs and start a program across all four cities. So there's council members involved. You're talking like, you know, assistant chiefs, depending on how, you know, captains, just depending on, so that's not enough money to deal with for uh, all those egos. I said, I just can't, all those male egos. And they just laughed and I'm like, no, I'm serious. So I need more money. <laughs> and then they're, you know, they, and we, we met at a very reasonable uh, number, but don't take a number, you know, you fight for yourself. You fight for the number that you want. Um, And I think people don't talk about salary enough. I was having this conversation earlier with a colleague. I think we've been kind of conditioned to not talk about how much we make, but just because it's like a taboo subject. Um, And I understand that, but we also have to be realistic that we need to know what people are making and how do we get that rate? And how do we, you know, how do we negotiate? I always tell people, if you need to negotiate, call me because I will help you tell you, like list your skills and why you need more money. Um, Pick your top three skills and say, this is why I'm asking for, these are the reasons I'm asking for more money. When I went to the city, you know, resources, human resources, I went to the city manager and I was like, how many egos do you have to deal with on a daily basis? I was just like, cause that's why I'm asking for, cause he told me, he's like, you're asking for more money than a police officer makes. And I was just like, yep. <laughs> then you can get a police officer to do this job. I was like, and deal with all the people that he's gonna, they're gonna have to deal with. And he was just like, fair enough. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so you just don't ever take the first offer and talk about money don't feel bad about it. Don't feel guilty. I think women and social workers in general um, do that in my experience. So talk about it and fight for your fight for every dollar. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good point. We've had a little bit of conversation about that, about salaries with women, especially going into the STEM area, um, how women uh, make less money. And We tend not to negotiate for ourselves. We tend to accept that stereotype um, that we don't need as to earn as much as a male counterpart does. Mm -hmm. And part of that problem is we don't talk about our salaries. Uh, A life coach that I've been listening to now for about four years, she's big on women sharing their salaries and she shares, you know, she makes like, $75 $75 million a year in her business, but she'd been doing yeah. it for a while. But, um, you know, she has other women on her program and she flat out asked them, you know, what's your salary? Why did you yep. get there? Because we need to see what's possible. We need yes. to know what's possible. And so it shouldn't be taboo. We should be able to say, I've mm-hmm. been able to earn this amount of money. You're going to be able to earn this amount of money. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, hold yourself up to the fact that I have the knowledge, I have the skills. Even if it's an entry level job that you're going into, it's your first job, you may actually say, well, I'm not quite there yet, but you let them know you are there. And then on the background, you can get yourself up to the speed that needs to be there. But I think that's really important. And that's really important in these areas where men are dominant and we make the le- we make less money. It's just... Yeah. It's just a fact. It's a fact yeah. that social work, yeah. um, yep. if men are in social work, they go into administration. Mm-hmm. They don't go into direct practice. <laughs> I even had two friends that she had been at the dialysis center for like five or six years. They hired one of our other friends who came from the hospital and he was a male and they hired him at a dollar more an hour than they were paying wow. her. And she yep. had the experience. Yep. So it happens. And Every day. so we have to really 
demonstrate our skills and mm -hmm. say, now, this is the amount of money that I'm going to need to perform this position because this is the value I'm providing to you. That's the key. What value are you exchanging for that, that salary? And you've got and value you don't, to exchange. If you don't feel comfortable negotiating, reach out to someone you trust. Reach out to Dr. Todd. Reach out to me. Share my email. Like, just say, how would I go about this? You know, because usually it's all by email, right? Like, or it's, you know, nowadays, it's not over the phone. It's usually in a written offer letter. And so you can, like, how do we counteract this? And what would I say? Reach out to someone that you feel like can help you, like, um, put the words together that you're trying to say. And, uh, you know, I've worked in, you know, enough when hiring and, and management, like I know how to, what HR is looking for. Dr. Judd, you know, as the uh, former chair, she knows what the university is looking for and those key words. The other thing I want to say is, um, and I'll leave you with this, never say you're just anything because I always hear women, I cut them off. I'm just a social worker. I'm just a nurse. I met this woman at my house the other day. She's meeting with my husband, long story, but we have a pig business. It's a long story. FFA. I don't know if y'all maybe in commerce, y'all know we have a FFA. <laughs> pig. Anyway, I was meeting her. She had already been at the barn and, she, and uh, she told me she worked at the hospital. I was like, Oh, great. What do you do? She's like, Oh, I'm just a CNA. I'm like, Oh, you're never just anything. Mm -hmm. You, if you're a CNA, you're probably running the whole floor. Aren't you? How many patients are you seeing more than nurses? And I caught people caught women off because I've never, and my husband looked at me and he said the same thing. I've never heard a man other than owning, my husband's an electrician. I've never heard him say, I'm just an electrician. I've never heard him say that. I've never heard his friend say, I'm just a doctor. I'm just a police officer. I'm just this. Only women say that. Mm -hmm. And that again is like, stand up, never say you're just anything. I only hear women say that. And so I try and cut them off and, um, you know, respectfully, but I just say, no, never say you're just that because yeah. you are actually probably doing a lot more than that because women always take on more roles and you will never ever hear a man say I'm just that they say what they are and that's it <laughs> that's yeah that's the truth we, we have air conditioning repair going on here so, <laughs> so we're hearing <laughs> that too um but we had that brief conversation earlier never just say just because I'm a woman you shouldn't yeah. take me less never just say yeah. that yeah, yeah. we are no. way more than just yeah um, so the words do matter the words yeah. matter and but Absolutely. you're right it's, it's typically men. I don't think you've ever heard a man say, well, just because I'm a man, I should earn more money mm -hmm. or I should yeah. be paid less. Yeah. Um, so the words are important. The words that we use for ourselves are very important. And I'm so sorry this is going on. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. It. Um, I'll, I'll, but we I haven't, haven't had air conditioning, so hopefully they're fixing it and we'll get it soon. No, I had to run to another meeting, but okay. I'm so excited that y'all are there to support each other and just, you know, reach out if you need anything. But know that, you know, like Dr. Judd said, words do matter. Any position can be anything you make it. Any field can be anything you make it. You know, think about what you want to be and then go, go for, it. for it. Nothing, you know, I'm, I'm older. I, you know, I'm. I'm, you know, I'm 41 and I'm just now at the point where I'm very confident in where I'm at and being able to say these things. You would have met me 10 years ago. I wouldn't have been talking like this. I think women um, grow into the confidence. So try and, you know, start using the right language now and it's supporting each other now um, and making, you know, call each other out, your friends out and say, don't say that. Like, don't just, you know, don't downgrade anything, you know, so be supportive of each other and, you know, I know we talk about women power and female power, but it really is true. If I would have started this, if I would have started probably acting or having this confidence 10 or 15 years ago, I'd probably be making double what I make now. <laughs> yeah. So start now. Thank you so much for your time. Bye, Dr. Judd. Thank y'all. And um, I'll be in touch and yeah. enjoy your next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Feel free to share my email if anybody needs it. Okay. I Thank will do you. that. Thank you. Bye. Bye.